So welcome to Church History 101, the early church fathers and the patristic era. And um, this is going to be a course that I hope will be informative, that people can get a chance to understand what actually happened for the, in the early church and how it um, moved from the, the disciples, the apostles, and gradually that, that witness was passed on from generation to generation. It's an interesting trend that you'll see that in the early church, Jesus spent three years of his life 24 seven with the apostles. And as um, Jesus was saying, as he was leaving, he would fill these, um, the apostles with the Holy Spirit, that they would be clothed with power from on high. And from that, they were called to bring the good news to the ends of the earth. And it's interesting what happened with the um, apostles that they actually made this agreement that different people went to, to different locations like um, St. Thomas went to India and um, you if you're familiar if you were to look at some of the um, early church um, writings you you'll find a little bit about that about how they they started to fan out and go to these different locations and then we have the what became known as the Patristics Fathers, or Patristic is just a word that means father. And so we're gonna trace through a variety of those as we work through this material. Um, and But first let's do an introduction to give some perspective about what is church history and what is it that we're gonna try and cover. So this class will discuss the development of the early church after the resurrection of Christ. Early on, there was a strong linkage to those who walked with Jesus, especially the apostles, like as I was just trying to, to bring you that perspective. And over time, this connection became the disciples of the apostles and then the, the disciples of their disciples. And so it, it was a, a multiple um, generations, spiritual generations of that being passed on. And they were very intent of making sure that they were faithful to what was the original things, the the parables, the 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 narrative of, of these people that had a first um, a face to face encounter with with Jesus. And so this class is going to walk through that process of how it went from Jesus to the apostles and slowly formed into the, the church as we know it. And um, it was just a very gradual trend. People were faithful to the gospel. They were sharing that um, literally around the known world that they had at that time. And then over a period of time, as these eyewitnesses um, went to be with the Lord, they started to realize that they had to codify this so that they could pass it on to, to others. Um, this is interesting to, to think, what is history? And um, in German, they actually have two words. In English, we only have one. And history, the, the first definition may be of what we're more familiar with, uh, historia. It means the the events that happened. It's like being a reporter, you know, you know, given the exact chronology of how it went. But there's also another thing. It's called the Geschichte, or which means the telling, the story that someone would tell about the history. And so this is what I think is um, really wonderful that we have in the Gospels as well as in Acts. Um, we, we have this wonderful telling of these, these things that took place, and we have that, that continue on through the, the, the early church fathers. Um, in terms of what does it mean to be, in, be doing a, a historical investigation and mapping through what, what took place in, in the early church? We, we, we talked about history, and there's, there's two possible words, at least in German, that we could think about that. And the type of individual that would be looking at that is would be someone that's called a historian. But there's another interesting word that I thought was cool. It's called historiography. And this is one of the things that I got introduced in some of my courses uh, in seminary when I was looking at church history. And uh, his, in historiography, you're, you're looking and, and interpreting ancient manuscripts. And so when we look at the, the Bible, it's full of, it's 66 books that each together are trying to, to give us a piece of that story. And we, and a lot of different facts that are in each one of those books that we can then um, 
pull out and start to to make some understanding, um, some some assessment of what is actually flowing. Um, okay, let me. I'm going to try and add one person and um, see if I can help her get information for the class. So let me pause just for a second. <laughs> You guys hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Oh, you're. I, I'll. Sorry, Jim. You already started. Oh, that. Hey, Tony. We're just. Um, I had to download I, the app. Otherwise, I had to download the app. So. Well, you, you can um, let me know what you think about the the app and the experience afterwards. Um, Do you like this better than Zoom? This uh, Teams. Well, I'll put it this way. I'm I'm yeah. familiar with it, and this is the the tool that I've I've used. I I know it better than Zoom, and I think overall it's more robust in a couple things that um, it could handle hundreds, if not thousands, of people um, watching the same, um, be in the same group, if you will. Okay. So that's I one had, of the I things. Had, uh, I had a little over thirty. I taught a class for ev free yesterday in the morning but i nick i did watch service yesterday too awesome <laughs> <laughs> I, watched your, I watched worship i watched your worship i was there with you guys but i taught yesterday early at like 8 30 and i think they had about 35 on at the same time yeah well wonderful yeah you know good. um gina is going to be joining in and there was another person that she said that was interested that's going to try and come um marie and then uh, Veronica, and so I passed it on to Veronica as well. So I maybe uh, take a little bit of time for people to get the some of the technology down. So mm -hmm. I'm actually recording this, and so they can go look at it as, as they like. That's another thing about Teams. You can actually record okay. it, and it stays on Teams, and so people just can log in at their leisure and then watch it. So I was just walking through the, the overview. Um, I know Nick said that he's really excited about the classes that we're offering here at New Hope Academy yeah. and, and just learning more about scripture and all that. So well, now that I realize I, I realize that the timings are, are different, um, I, I really want to see if I could take that the uh, Roman Catholicism class, too. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm yeah. just going to send out my link about 10 to 7. So okay. if you uh, if you have the wherewithal to stick through uh, back to back sessions, I mean, by all means. Yeah, we, we intentionally yeah. made it so we could um, um, people could take both if they wanted. So, and um, trying to make it so it would be in relatively convenient um, afternoon slash evening hours. Yeah, so, yeah, that's really terms, great. That's good. In terms of the the theological arc that is um, developed with the, the early church fathers. Um, this tries to give you an idea of um, some of the big theological pillars, per se, that are out there. And it really, did, if you think about it, um, back when the apostles were around and then their disciples, they didn't have like, um, you know, the all the eons of commentaries and things to draw from. They all had to to, to take it and develop it from scratch. And so just trying to figure out the nature of a triune God, to figure out the full nature of what who Christ is, that Christ is uh, both God and man. And then they started to explore what was the nature of the Holy Spirit. That's really kind of about the what was um, covered in this time period. And it wasn't until later that they started to more fully flesh out each one of these theological concepts like what are the the exact nature of salvation and and uh, what is the the nature and purpose of the church and then focusing on things like the 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 end times so i thought this was a kind of an interesting verse um to think what paul had to say about the the great commission um it's and, and this is in 2 Timothy um, chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. And this is Paul talking to one of his disciples, Timothy. And so he's trying to pass on him, mentor them. 
make him a church leader and to take on the torch after he's um, has gone to, to be with the Lord. And it's interesting that we have some other documents in antiquity that start to give us a little bit more insight into the into the life of people like Timothy. And so he says, remember Christ Jesus risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to the gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For the reason I endure all these things for, for the sake of those who are chosen to those that that also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus and in his, in his in eternal glory. And then he gives us um, this wonderful little um, a creed. And this is another thing that's um, an, another in, uh, interesting point to have us think about scripture. And, and he says it's a trustworthy statement. Where if we died with him, we also live with him. Oh, look at nice. And I, uh, Hi, Gina. How are you? Hi. This is Marie. <laughs> Maria. Hi. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm glad you could join us. I, I sent you the information um, right before um, we got started. And let me just do a quick little um, heads up on things. I'm actually going to be recording these lectures. And so one of the neat things about Teams is you can go and um, listen to those lectures anytime you lot, want. I think Gina has um, the copy from the last time I, I presented this as well. But this will be another way maybe a little bit more compact and a little bit more readily available online if you if you guys would like to watch that. And so um, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go. And another thing, if you guys have questions, I, this is not a monologue. I'm not trying to, you know, just put you to sleep by just having view graphs. And so the more interactive, the better. And um, I'm really want to go at the pace that, that you guys feel comfortable with. Um, I think you guys have the course pack, and um, and if you don't, I'll make sure that you get it. And whatever you'd like to do, if you'd like to print it out, or if you just want to have it um, alongside with us going through the material, I'll be pre presenting the slides through through Teams, and um, we'll also refer to some other material um, in the in the textbook and um, other things. So. We were just following through with an introduction of what it what church history is all about, and um, we'll continue just going along as as we're as we're doing with this. Any questions before I continue on? No. No. You guys can hear me, okay? I can hear you. Okay. So. That's really like the first part of the, the Great Commission, if you will, that, that Paul is giving to Timothy. And then he quotes this creed, what I was just telling you about. And this is like examples in the New Testament of these sayings that were captured. And Paul in some places actually says, like in 1 Corinthians 15, I pass on to you what I have received. And then he quotes something. And so these are the known ways of capturing the, the early truth of the church. And as a trustworthy say, saying, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also deny us. And if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. He, for he cannot deny himself. And then the, the second part that he brings up is, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to a ruin of, of the hearers. Be diligent to pre present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling actually the word of truth. So wonderful inspiration that um, Paul is passing on to, to Timothy. So that's just a quick introduction. Um, I have some charts that will hopefully um, help out in terms of um, helping us walk through a chronology of how these things um, work. And so, um, and also talk about some of these schools of thought that were starting to develop over time in the, the early church period. And there was this one point of view that was prevalent in the West, the more of the um, Western point of view um, deriving out of the, the school in Antioch. 
versus the school in Alexandria. And I like to, to, to remember, they didn't like have the internet like we do now. And so scholars would have to hang around these, these huge libraries that would have all these resources. And so they had this wonderful library in Alexandria and then the, the, the various um, resources that were available in Antioch. Um, so the patristic period um, last, de depending on who you're talking to, roughly around um, the first 500 to maybe 800 years. Um, it was the, this period that started with the time of Christ and the apostles, and then there was this gradual development of the church started to get precedence. There was the uh, the apostles, the disciples, and then the disciples of the disciples, and then the disciples of the disciples of the disciples. And roughly around three spiritual generations that they had that really tight coupling. And eventually um, they could no longer have a really tight, tight linkage all the way back to, to Jesus. And that's when the, the church started to have a lot more um, precedence in how the, the formation of a believers and the Christian community started to develop. And so I have like these little starbursts here, these yellow starbursts, and these are some of the individuals that we'll be covering as we go. And the various charts, they, they try and show this in a couple different perspectives. And um, we'll be referencing these period periodically as we go through the course. Will we be um, copies of these charts? Okay, I, what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll make a PDF and s send a synopsis of some of these, um, these charts here in the beginning, okay? Oh, cool, cool, thank you. Um, and this is a, a little bit more of a tighter view of the, the very early part of the, um, the patristic period, the, the early church fathers. And so you can see how um, you have a life of Christ, you have Paul of Tarsus, and then we have these individuals where we start to, to, to get an idea of who they were, when they lived, and who, know, who knew who. And there was some interesting um, spiritual coupling between the, um, the church fathers. And so the ones way back here, we'll be talking about Clement of Rome. He'll be one of the first individuals that we'll be talking about. Um, Ignatius, um, Polycarp, and those are wonderful uh, individuals. And there's also the, this thing called the, the Didache, the, the, the teaching of the 12 apostles that we'll get a chance to have um, a perspective and, and think about that and, and ponder on that book. This is zooming out a little bit more, and we'll be getting back to some of these names here. Like the, this first one, it talked about the um, the apologist. Um, let me see. Sorry, it's just going forward, not backwards. So let me do it this way. So this is um, one example of an overview chart, and this is. Um, what is called the Anti-Nicene, so the very beginning of the, the Church Fathers, which then started to the, the next phase what was called the Apologists, people that were um, starting to develop a, um, a defense of the faith and try and respond that, you know, there was a little bit of getting the word out and now people were having to respond to what do other people think about this and so um, we, we start to once again see some of these individuals over time. And the, the next one here is now what's called the, the, the golden era of the fathers, which is getting out towards uh, the latter part of the patristic period. And I think that's what I've got for, for those on those way of presenting the, the details. And these, this material is also in the course packet, but it gives some of the, the key events. And I tried to put, highlight in blue the ones that we will be specifically focusing on. Each one of these is, is noteworthy for us to consider. 
but um, I just want to at least give a few things for for us to, to contemplate. Um, Polycarp um, was a, a one of the the key individuals that um, was someone I'll be talking about um, in shortly, and then there there's others. So I'll just leave that for for now. You can look at these at your leisure. And um, the way that the author of our textbook, he goes up to 636 um, up, up to, to that period. Let me see if I can, and a little bit beyond that. So, and then I was telling you about this, these two schools, the school of Antioch versus the school of Alexandria. The School of Alexandria was larger. Um, it was started, the, the city that it was in was started by Alexander the Great, thus the, the name Alexandria. It was a thriving center of education, culture, trade, commerce, and was, a, was rivaling Rome at, at times. So it's interesting when we think of Northern Africa, that's where it's located. That's not the maybe the perspective that we would have from our mindset, but that's how it was back then. It was a, a hotbed for the life of Rome, as well as um, for early Christianity as a place where it really started to um, develop a, a firm foundation. The school of Antioch was not as large or in, uh, as influential. It was founded by one of Alexander's um, generals, and it formed a trade center in the time of Christ and the apostles. And um, this was uh, the place that Paul actually used as his um, missionary um, starting point. So that, that's a little bit of history in comparison of the two. I, I'm sorry that the charts are jumping around. I'm, I'm, need to quite figure out why it's doing that. I may just go to showing these natively rather than through teams. It seems like it's getting a little bit messed up here. Um, so this is a chart that I'll be coming back to and slowly building upon as we cover different material. And we soon see that there is the Western Europe up on the upper left-hand corner, Eastern Europe and Asia. If you think of Constantinople, um, it's sort of the divide between Europe and Asia. And so sometimes where modern day Turkey is, it's called Asia Minor. And we see where the, the school of Antioch, and this was um, one of the places that largely informed what began to, to be key to the, the Western um, Roman Empire and the, the, the Western church. And Alexandria is what started to be a key element for the Eastern part of Christianity. Um, so I, I think I already mentioned this, but this is just a little bit more details in terms of the, the school of Alexandria and Antioch. And so the, the school of Alexandria had a, a little bit um, a different perspective by some of the key people that emerged from that school, Clement and Origen. Um, so they sought to, to dig through the layers of biblical meaning and discover hidden gems, um, thinking in terms of allegory. What would be the meaning and purpose that you can get that's beyond just the, the literal words? And so um, that's one of the things that they tended to highlight. Um, the, the school of Antioch tended to have a lot more of a literal interpretation. They wanted to be faithful to what they were seeing in the scripture and not deviate from that. And so um, a more of a literous, a historical, literal, grammatical approach. And so that would be a distinction. Um, I would like to say a distinction that it wasn't that allegory wasn't something that you would see from the school of Antioch and vice versa, that it, it did have a, an emphasis that they would tend to prioritize. Um, and so this, this map on the upper right-hand corner, it gives a little bit of perspective of what started to see 
um, a, the development in of what became Western Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox. There, we, we think of the, the Roman Catholic Church, the fact that they're saying Rome, it's, um, it's sort of a, a leaning back in this direction of when there was this kind of a, a divide and, and how that came about. Um, so the Alexandrian approach was more metaphysical and the, the Antioch approach was more moral and ethical. And so they, the, this emphasis started to have some um, different perspectives that they started to develop um, working out theological um, ideology. So now we're going to talk a little about who the church um, who is included and from the, the textbook they have a discussion about that um, this is the the list of chapters that are in our textbook um, when the church was young and I highlighted with a, a yellow burst the the ones that we're going to be prioritizing but we'll really be covering all the the, the people in the the text and so if you just go through the course pack or read through the, the, the text, you'll get a chance to be able to see and really um, cherish the, the witness of each one of these individuals. So I showed you this chart before, but now I've shown you with um, individuals of where they were located um, for the majority part of their ministry or where they from, where they were born. And so you can see how the a variety of folks were from Rome, people that were from Carthage um, and um, Africa, and also people from Alexandria, Antioch, I already mentioned, and then a, a large group from Constantinople, which started to, to be the, the basis for the Eastern um, underpinnings of the, the, the church. The, the ones that are in orange, these are um, examples of um, some additional people that we will talk about. And um, I think I have a few other individuals that were more on the heretical side. Um, and so this is just a little bit of um, perspective on some of those individuals. So there's basically four eras that took place during this early church period. Um, I grouped them in three, but I still have all four numbers. And so first was the what's called the anti-Nicene before the Latin fathers. And so this is a time when it was mostly Greek. And then over time, it started to go from Greek to Latin being the chief language used by the, the early church. Jim, so we have the can, Apollo, I, can I jump in there? Can I jump in there for a second? Well, please do. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're clear. Anti-Nicene means before the Nicene Council. So I don't know if you're if that's still coming. Uh, yeah, I don't know that it has to do with the the languages per se. But were were you getting to the Nicene Council in three twenty five? Yeah. That's okay. That's what's here under three. This is okay. uh, that's so. Um, that was the the major part of it. It was the the Council of Nicaea right in the middle of this chart. So let me pause for is there any other questions or observations? Um, I know it's a little bit different format when we're all online, but I would love um, any comments or what you guys are thinking. I don't really know what. Can you, uh, can you explain? Maria is really a new believer. And um, can you explain what the patristic era is about? Sure, Maria. And please feel free to ask any questions because I want to make sure that I help you um, get the, the better understanding of what this means. Um, you're familiar with. Um, Jesus, I'm sure, and I'm sure you've heard the, the 12 apostles, right? No. She's really, <laughs> really new. Okay. Well, um, if we look in the, the New Testament, there's four Gospels, and there's a lot of letters that were written by individuals that they start to tell the story of what it was like to 
meet Christ. And then they, st- they were given this, this, um, this command. They were, um, Jesus asked them to, to go out and to spread the Gospels to the whole world. And so we have this wonderful experience of this story unfolding. And so what we have in, in Scripture, and when we get a little bit more precise, when we start looking at the New Testament, we have the story of the, the start of the, the Christian church. Um, and so right about 100 AD is when what is written in Scripture stops, and then we get a chance to be looking at, well, how did it actually continue to grow at that point? And so Scripture is our ultimate source, but it's really fun to start to look at, well, what were some of these individuals? What were they like? Um, what kind of encounters did they have when they were trying to be faithful to to, to how they understood um, the, the message and purpose of, of, of Jesus Christ and start to relate it to their specific situation. Um, they, they were still under Roman rule at this time um, for, for those that stayed close to, to Rome and, and, and that area. And they had to start to figure out how to um, deal with these, these difficult situations. And so the early church what we're trying to show here is we're going to be t- talking about 30 or so individuals and just talk about their story and reflect about how they started to um, apply the, the truths of Christ to, to their culture and their situation. Jim, can I add to what you just said, which was... Uh, yeah, please uh, do. So, Maria... Um, uh, you belong to a family, right? I mean, everybody's got a biological family. And now, uh, as a new believer, you're a new believer, you belong to a, a church family, right? Um, so every family has a history, right? And when we study when we study the history of the church, we're studying basically the history of our family, okay? Um, as you continue to study in your Bible now, you'll see that God uh, created a... Uh, church when he brought uh, the people who followed Jesus, the apostles, together on a day called Pentecost. That was the beginning of the church, which is also called the body of Christ. Okay. And then just like Jim said, those men spread the truth about Jesus throughout what was called, I'm sure you've learned about the Roman Empire in your school studies. So in one sense, the history of the church is our family history, going all the way back to Jesus himself and his first followers, and then the people who learned from them, and the people who learned from them, and on down the line for the last almost 2,000 years. Okay, so it's, like Jim said, in one sense, about learning the individuals in the church family that we now belong to as well, okay? It's also, uh, church history is also the study of Western civilization. Uh, because Christianity in around the 4th century became the official religion of the Roman Empire, which was a, in a, it's a huge, it was a huge empire. And as Christian missionaries spread east and west, um, many nations or kingdoms became Christian. Okay, So the history of the Western world is really a history of Christianity. Uh, both go hand in hand. Uh, you don't get all of the, if you ever go take a trip to Europe and see all the cathedrals and the old churches and the artwork and the music and all of that culture is informed by hundreds and hundreds of years of of the Christian church, like Jim just said, um, taking the gospel and trying to share it with the local cultures that they found all the way up to the new world in the 17th, 16th, 17th century when Spanish missionaries came to places like Mexico and found the Native Americans there shared the gospel with them. So it's both of those things. It's a personal history of our family, but it's also the intellectual history of the entire Western world and also parts of the um, So I think maybe that helps, gives you a, a really big framework for what Jim's going to do then is talk about these first few hundred years of, of that history. Yeah, and I, and I only brought it up because I took Jim's class already but i'm taking it again because there were a lot of things 
you know, I grasp, but not everything. So, yeah. you know, I know that if I was struggling with some of those things, I know that Maria, being a new believer, is like, she's like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> well, um, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. That that reminds me. So um, we're going over certain things. Like right now, we're talking about like the Nicene Council, and I'm not really familiar with a lot of that stuff. Are we going to learn about like what the Nicene yes. Council was? Yeah, that? we're definitely going to be talking about that. And um, maybe what I'll do is I'll go back to the timeline charts and maybe spend a little bit more time on that. Um, I'm going to display the um, information a little bit differently here because um, I think it might be easier to, to see it this way and I could interact with the material a little bit more. So um, can you can you see my um, the what I'm showing? Yeah, your desktop. Yes. Yeah. Let me try and see if I can do it one other way. Give me a second. Um, okay. So yeah, I'll do it, do it that way. Um, what this will allow me to do is. Um, I can move my cursor around here and then you'll be able to see my cursor. So that might be a little bit better. So let's just spend some time with these. Um, these are, it's, it's really hard to read, I, th I think. Um, but if you have it on the, um, the course packet, mm -hmm. yes. it'll also be here. And so um, let me just mention a couple of these things. And so we are talking about the Council of Nicaea. Let's see if I can see that. Um, so the Council of Nicaea is in 325 AD, and so that's kind of like um, sort of the middle um, where things happen here. And so, so this is right here is the the Council of Nicaea. So that's this is like a big event, and so this is like um, what would be an example of like. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page of what we on some some basic things about um, theology and, and how we're going to make sure everybody's on the same page. And they had these various councils, and this is the first one that they had. And so everything before that is really a lot of focus on individuals being faithful and loving Christ and many of them being martyrs for their faith. And we'll get a chance to hear one by one um, all the way up um, to Origen, um, Cyprian, and then about um, a little bit after that is when we'll start to get into the Nicene Council of Nicaea. So from the, let me look at it this way. So the Council of Nicaea is right here, chapter 16. So it's roughly about halfway through the book. And so we're going to be seeing all these other individuals first. Um, we'll be talking about Clement of Rome, and that's the thing that I'll probably finish up tonight, talking about Clement of Rome. And um, depending on any questions that you guys might have. And so we, we did this rough chronology uh, we talked a little bit about the church fathers um, with some of those pictorial charts, and now we can move in and talk to Clement of Rome. Maria, does that help just to give you some context? Do you have any questions? No. Okay. Please, I, I would hope that people don't feel bad about um, stopping me or asking questions, because I, I, I tell you, I really don't want to just lecture and I would rather have it be an inter interactive. So, like you just saw in a couple of those charts, 
the, the Council of Nicaea is right in the middle. And this is kind of a dividing line in terms of what was happening to the, the early church fathers. So the first was the, the initial fathers, they called them the apostolic fathers. These people were martyred for their faith, a lot of these individuals. The apologists who started to defend the faith. And so um, this happened until the what was called the Edict of Milan, when religious freedom was made legal. And so you were no longer it was no longer illegal to be a Christian in AD 313. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if it was illegal to be a Christian? And then after that, um, yeah, it seems like we're moving in that direction, unfortunately. Maybe. And then after that, we have the Council of Nicaea. Um, and this is an interesting mixture of both um, church leaders, um, people of state. And so we have like a clear distinction between state and um, church here. That actually didn't exist. There was a, a kind of a, a lot more of a coupling um, between those two um, different um, entities. And so they, they were engaging on both of those fronts. And then we have this, this wonderful era of um, these people that may be familiar, Ambrose, Augustine, um, um, Athanasius, and Basil, and um, some of the, the heroes that were more um, known in the, in the West Church versus the East Church. And that's what we'll be focusing on as we go. Any questions on that? No. Nope. So um, who are the church fathers and who's included and who is not included? The church fathers characterized by orthodoxy, holiness, antiquity, and church approval. And so our author and also those that were um, highly um, would would make these assessment of who to be focusing on. These are the kind of qualities that they would be looking for. So orthodox, that they would they were following with what was known to be true up to that point. You know, we're not graded on our theology. That doesn't mean you know over time we can study deeply God's word and start to understand more. Holiness, that they represent the values that we see that God would have us to hold. Antiquity, that they were old. That they fall into this time frame, and that the church approved. So, were they going with the church, or were they going against the church? And so, these writers passed on and clarified apostles' teachings from second to the eighth century. So, it was a it was a um, a building process that we we knew everything we needed to know to be saved by the message that Jesus gave us. But we started to be able to, to, to go a little bit further of what exactly is, is the nature of God? What exactly does it mean that Jesus can be God and man? And so they initially there were eyewitnesses. And then they had, they in the text, they talk about the, the seven great councils. And so we're just going to be focusing on the first one. And the two major things during this time frame that they were focusing on was on the Trinity and that Jesus is the only God man, that he was both God and man. So that's really what we're um, talking about. I kind of like this chart. It's like a spiritual pedigree chart. I, um, if you've ever looked, studied your family tree, or maybe you've got, um, we even have um, a pedigree for our cats. My, my, my <laughs> wife kind of think that's pretty cute. And so it's interesting to, to see how, who was influenced by who. And one of the neat things that we have as believers is we can establish our network. Who are we influenced? Who mentored us? And who mentored the people that mentored us? And who are the people that we disciple? And who are the, those people that are discipled by, by them? And we have this, this spiritual fabric that is there. And so, of course, we have to start with Jesus. And the three main pillars that we're going to be using at least according to this chart is, is Paul, Peter, and John. And this is an interesting lineage that um, who um, did John disciple? He, I, he, dis, he discipled Polycarp, and I, I just mentioned his name, 
but that was like the the first spiritual generation and after that polycarp um he actually mentored irenaeus and then finally irenaeus um discipled hippolytus and we will touch each one of these individuals as we go in terms of peter peter um mentored um ignatius and this was someone i think that um Gina and Paul really identified with, and we'll be talking about their story. Finally, Paul, we have Clement of Rome. And if you, interesting, if you were to, to look at um, First Clement, it reads like um, Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, and it's almost like sometimes it's informally called um, Corinthian, Third Corinthians. And so. This is a chart that I will come back to when I'm touching on some of these individuals. I'll be trying to give you an idea of where they were at, where was their spiritual heritage, and and you can see as you, as you slowly work down this um, this spiritual lineage tree, eventually you, you can't. It's just too many generations removed, and that's where the importance of the church started to really come to be really important because it was no longer based on word of mouth, passing on things from generation to generations and just reading a letter or two from Paul. As you're putting that all together in everything that we know is scripture, and that's the canon, that's a fancy word that we use for, for what, what it means and what is the contents of, of, of the Bible. I have a question. Sure. Um, since these like polycarp they were they must have been contemporary they were, they were around since they were it says they were um uh, taught by like saint john or john so right. are, are any of these people uh mentioned in scripture um some of them are like um it might be right uh, let me I, I think clement is mentioned in scripture in romans wow. i think clement is mentioned in romans one you know you know how paul says the uh, at the end of the letters, Paul will oftentimes say to so the greet, church of Antioch or yeah, or greet, you know, greet so and so. I yeah. think it shows up once or twice, right, Jim? Yeah, yeah. So for this chart, there's there's just like one or so. But that's another interesting thing um, that I've actually had fun doing. And I, I could show you a, a chart. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try and pull something up to, to give you an idea of. Um, Sorry about the screens popping in and out. But, Jim, know. can I make one point that might also bring this home a little bit for uh, maybe for Maria, yeah, sure. the new believer? You know, um, and again, as we continue to read our Bibles and understand uh, a lot of what Jesus is saying, but really what happens at on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit unites together everyone who has believed in Jesus's words and his resurrection from the dead, uh, which was confirmation of that he was the Messiah of Israel and the Son of God. And, you know, what what the Bible really is saying, especially in, in Paul's letters, OK, and you'll learn about Paul, is that these men right here and and the women that were around the same at the time, I mean, the, it was five women who are several women who found the, the empty tomb from which Jesus emerged alive. In some very real way, we are more related, more connected, closer to these people than maybe even our own biological relatives. That's what the Bible is telling us. This is the body of Christ that is united by the power of God. So these people who we only know their names, or maybe we, we have a few lines uh, of history about them, or we have a letter or two from them, we are in one sense more their brother or their sister, and they are brother and sister, than maybe, maybe even one of my own relatives back in Chicago. And that's because these are all men and women who affirm the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And... The Holy Spirit takes care of the rest in uniting us together. So, so that's I just want to that's that's why we study these folks, because we will be with these people forever, you know. And then we'll actually get to meet them face to face as well. So I just I don't know. May, hopefully that also helps you understand why um, it's important to understand church history because it is this real family history that we have. 
Yeah, thank you, Tony. And um, once again, I, I really appreciate the dialogue. I know it may be a little bit intimidating, but hopefully as we get more familiar, you guys will just feel free to ask whatever questions come up. Because that's what I've really liked about past um, classes is that we, we had this wonderful dialogue. Um, these are well, just some charts. Just to uh, piggyback on what Tony said right now, sure. um, I think it's also important too because, I mean, to study uh, church history because once we grow in our faith, we have people, we have other people asking us, well, where did your faith come from? Where, why do you believe what you believe? And yep. so yeah. <clears throat> I think that's the other reason for me, at least, why it's important for me to understand some of this thing. I mean, I've heard the Council of Nicene. I've heard, I've heard of that, but I didn't know how to explain it to anybody. You know, I didn't really know the history behind it. I didn't know how they were formed. I didn't know why they were formed. I didn't know anything about it. So it's really, as you grow and people begin to ask and challenge you, challenge your faith, I think it's important to know your history and what you, why you believe what you believe. And it further confirms, you know, the uh, validity of the gospel. And like in any family, um, there's there's arguments, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You, we what do we do when we have arguments in the family? We have big gatherings and we try and figure out what we're arguing over. And, and that's what... <laughs> That's what these councils were. I mean, we're a big family. We know Jesus is, is king. We know he's Lord. But we have all these other questions that we're trying to figure out. And so, you know, it's, it's, that's basically what it was, the church coming together as a family and trying to uh, have, you know, arguments over, you know, what they believed and what was the right way of doing things. And that's what these councils were, basically. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Tony, we were actually having some discussions about this, um, Tony and I, um, on a related note. It's like the Lord uses people. We're fallen, sin uh, sinful people, but he still uses us. And so we're always trying to distill out what it's us and put in as much as we can what is it of God. And um, and the, these councils and the, the, the life and testimony of these individuals, those are all examples how that being worked out. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I I like having maps and pictures and stuff like that. And so this was uh, another um, giving you another picture, giving you some some insight into the Roman Empire during the, the time of the, the early church fathers. And so I won't be focusing on in detail on this, but you you'll find some names that may be kind of familiar. You know, the, the region of Egypt, what we would know as modern day Egypt, um, Spain, um, we have what was became Gaul, and eventually this is France, comes later, Italy, um, Macedonia, um, modern day Turkey is here, and so it just goes on and on. The, the, the Roman Empire at that time, it still was united. But you see this dotted line, eventually it falls apart and there's a schism and it, it goes into two empires. And so there was still the um, leadership, the capital in Rome, but there was also this competing in the eastern part of the, of the Roman Empire in Constantinople. And so those cities that we will be referring to come up, there's an interesting parallel between the, the state and what's going on with the church. Um, the, that was part of God's plan that um, the, you know, they, they were working together in, in, in hand in hand. And this shows you more specifically even more of the, the more detailed um, lo locale of these, these different um, places. And if you, if you want, you can look that up and um, read more about it. But I'm not going to go into that in detail here. So that's just a little bit more of an interview, of an overview, and now we'll start to get into the, the church fathers. And the the first one that we're going to be talking about is Clement of Rome. And um, so Clement of Rome, uh, he ministered around 92 to 101, so somewhere around that type, time. He was an early bishop of Rome. And just like... Um, Tony was mentioning, um, it's likely, um, I would say that makes a lot of sense, that he's the Clement that's mentioned in Philippians 4.3. 
And um, we get this from two individuals. Origen is going to be one of the people we're going to study. And Eusebius, he is a church historian. So imagine that you're, you're sitting at um, one of these huge libraries, like in um, um, <clears throat> Antioch or Alexandria. You have all these books that are available to you. And he wrote these multiple volumes. And um, um, Nick, you were mentioning, um, you, you saw one of the references where they had a lot of these ancient documents. Um, yes, Eusebius, yes. It's, he has like volumes and volumes of information that he has a very, a very long, detailed chronology of the early church. So much that it's kind of put into a, an interesting category. And so instead of calling it a secondary source, it's actually considered what's another word to call it a primary source. We get a lot of primary references from that from Eusebius because some of the material that he was quoting has actually been lost. Um, so he wrote an epistle to the Corinthians, um, First Clement, and like I said, it has a lot of uh, similarities to um, the what Paul wrote to Corinthians. He he had to experience that he was banished under one of the Roman emperors, and according to tradition, he was bound to an acre and thrown into the Black Sea. So it's it's an unfortunate illustration of the, these these individuals, these faithful men of God, um, ultimately gave their life um, following Christ. Question about them. Um, sure. For so. The epistle of the to the Corinthians, First Clement, uh, and this probably has to do when later on when we get to um, if we do get to the um, where they where they put the canon together uh, yeah. of biblical scripture. Uh, if he was really close with, uh, I think he was Saint John, right? With John, um, what, why yeah, is right it not here, according to this? It was, to it was kind of a, even a so close association with Paul. So why why is it not included in scripture? Just a question. It almost did, and actually, in some Roman Catholic circles, they still use it for for some liturgy. And so, it was probably one of the books that just barely did not get in scripture. Sorry, go ahead, Tony. Um, just for just to, for clarification, and and we can get we'll get into some of this material. We'll will will uh, also cover in the next in t tonight's later class on Roman Catholicism. Uh, I'll be going through early church history as well. You have, we have to do that if we're going to talk about Roman Catholicism. Um, just for clarification, though, all, all 27 books of the New Testament are the same for Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Protestant churches. <laughs> the differences are in the Old Testament. Uh, well, not. I'll explain that an, an, another time, but... But Jim was right in, in, you know, in pointing out First Clement was considered. It was close. In other words, it almost made the cut. <laughs> um, and there are internal reasons. There are reasons in the letter itself, like Clement saying that he's not one of the apostles uh, or at their level that made the church ultimately decide that they should leave it out, even though <clears throat> certainly we can still read it. And be edified through it. Uh, it just wasn't considered as revelatory or inspired in the same way as First Corinthians, Philippians, you know, Paul's letters, John's letters, so on and so forth. Well, it's interesting. Even in the letter, he doesn't even say his name. He's he. That's another thing that characterized him. He was a very humble man. Um, it was only the association of other people that they they said that this was something that was of um, Clement. And that's where we see this, um, Origen and Eusebius said this was written by Clement. It's yeah. worth reading. It's worth reading first, Clement. It's, 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 I mean, it's not that long. It's a fairly long letter, but you can get it online. All, those, all these ancient writings are usually free online. You can find them very quickly. Yeah, I have an excerpt from it, and um, Nick, this is like one of those sources that you were talking about, early church writings. And yeah, so I'm actually this, looking it up a, right now. Yeah. So oh, yeah. it's earlycristianwritings.com, yeah. 
Yeah. Christian, uh, CCEL.org, Christian Classic Cithero Library. Yeah, that's the other one. That's another one. And it's another great resource. And I think I have that listed in the syllabus as well. Um, so if you just read this and you close your eyes, you almost think you were reading from um, Corinthians, this, uh, first or second Corinthians. So the Church of God was sojourned at Rome, to the Church of God sojourning at Corinth, to those who are called and sanctified by the will of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and, and peace from Almighty God through Jesus Christ be multiplied. And then, um, then he turns our attention to points respecting which you consulted us. That sounds like what Paul would say. He, he was constantly um, being mindful of, um, of the people would ask him. And so they were looking to Clement as being a leader that could help them understand and discern how to apply Christian truth to their specific situation. I won't read that in detail, but that just gives you an example um, of how it looks. And it has a very similar feel to it, to um, other, to um, letters in scripture in the New Testament. So um, just to give you an idea, he is in Rome. And so the, the early church, um, um, there, there was, that was one of the places where the early church did start to have a, um, a root. Um, part of the, quote, Western church, although at that time that there really wasn't a distinction. Um, so Clement was associated with the household of Titus Flavius Clemens. Um, he, we, we mentioned this, that um, he is most likely, and I would say he is, the Clement of Philippians 4.3. Um, he was a uh, bishop of Rome, died around 97 AD. And um, he, he was definitely someone that was honored. We, we honor Linus, Cletus, and Clement. And so this is um, an example of him being referred to with, with high honors. And by ancient tradition, we mentioned this before, that he was arrested, sent to the North Sea, and, um, and then he was martyred by having an anchor tied around his neck. So... Um, what were some of the things that he contributed to um, the development, theological development? A fancy word is um, exegesis. Um, Clement handed down the apostolic teaching of Paul almost completely intact. So you saw that he was a disciple of Paul and he was being faithful to that. Um, and this is a, um, a modern day, um, well regarded. Um, early church um, historian, and, he, and according to him, he says, one of the most, this is one of the most important documents of sub-apostolic times. So not an, an apostle, but those were coming after the apostles. It, it contributes to our historical understanding, detailing Peter's ministry in Rome, Paul's travel to Spain, and their march of martyrdoms. It's the earliest example of apostolic um, succession dogma, and argues unequivocally for for primacy of the Roman Church. Um, it was interesting, and you'll hear more about this in Tony's class. But they had these bishops in all these different locales, and over a period of time, the the bishop in Rome started to become more important, and that's where eventually they they, they started to use the word pope, pope for for I think um, if I remember right, it's um, padre or the, the just yeah. papa. Basically, father, like father padre. Padre means yeah. father. Right? I mean, you guys speak Spanish, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the letter of First Clemens. It's uh, so he's a uh, the leader of this church. Um, he was known by Peter and Paul. He was very humble, and, and so so much so he neglected to mention his own name in his, his letter. So. Um, we know that Clement was the author of this um, letter based to the, the, what we have from the church fathers, um, um, Origen and Eusebius. And so, um, so what's the main reason for the letter? It lets the Corinthian church know in no uncertain terms that leadership, the leadership coup that occurred 
was entirely legitimate. And so there was a power struggle that was going on. And Clement insisted that the... Go ahead. Is there a question? Oh, no, no, okay. no sorry. Clement insisted that the apostles had inherited an orderly succession of authority in the church. So it, it makes sense. It's um, just like um, Church of New Hope and any other church, there's a way and um, people have to be showing themselves um, ready for ministry. You just don't, uh, you don't, don't default into that. It's something that you have to be um your your peers, people in the church, church leaders start to say, yes, we want to embrace this other person. And the apostles themselves, he stated, had commissioned leaders to shepherd the Corinthian church, and these elders and bishops commissioned others to succeed them in turn. The process of succession from the apostles was to be preserved and broken. So we're following what, what Jesus did. He, he, he chose the 12 um, apostles, and the apostles um, had disciples, and eventually we that got folded into the church and we need to be faithful to the church and eventually we can be become leaders if that's what we feel called to do. Um, and, you know, Jim, I, uh, something else, because this kind of came up, um, you know, sometimes when we're reading uh, the, the letters in the New Testament, whether they're Paul's letters or James's letters or John's letters or Peter's. Um, but especially in Paul's letters, there's a lot of names in there, right? I yeah. mean, we, we sort of skip over these names, but these were real people who had also received the gospel, believed the truth, and who were also um, passing on what, you know, what we would call today sound doctrine, right? So there was this succession of teaching, uh, yeah. as Jim's point, pointing out. So again, there's succession in the sense of people are coming to know Jesus through preaching, but then there's also the passing on of sound doctrine. Uh, because you've already seen in the Bible, right? If you read like first John or the book of um, Galatians, there were already people teaching false things about Jesus uh, that Paul and John themselves had to correct. So those false teachings didn't go away either. So the, the history of the early church is also this struggle for the truth. Uh, and to preserve the 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 true gospel that that Jesus gave to his followers, right? Yeah, thanks, Tony. I know this is um, an eye chart, and you won't be able to to read the names, but this is something that um, I found in terms of a reference. And these were all the people that in the New Testament that um, are mentioned in relationship to Paul. There you go. Yeah. And so um, there's just a large number. Um, and the, the ones in red are ones that I actually, um, some some more detailed research that I started to look at, the you know, the, the writers of the gospel, other significant um, individuals. Um, so that just gives you an idea um, that there's quite a lot. And so Paul is definitely a church planter and very much, he really saw, he was like the first person to develop a social network, <laughs> you know, like all, um, all the various Facebook, Twitter, whatever, LinkedIn. And so he was really good about doing that way back then. So any other comments or questions? I have a question. And um, I think the previous slide you had mentioned that Clement handing down the apostolic teaching of Paul almost completely intact. Why almost completely intact? Oh. Was he missing something? What was he what was he missing? Oh, I wouldn't read too much into the, the to the words per se. Um, I, um, the you know the disciples were no longer apostles, and so there was a special blessing, if you will, that the apostles had that would not be something that would be um, going from spiritual generation to disciples to disciples. So I think that would be an example of something that would be different. Um, like private, private letters, maybe. And say there that again. Maybe yeah. like private letters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, well, Jim, I don't know how you're using the almost there. I mean, uh, certainly he didn't just rewrite Second Corinthians, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't, I mean, he was using his own words, 
but all of his words were doctrinal, like in line with what Paul was saying. I think you could look at it that way, right? Just like every pastor today has to use words that we understand. They're not going to start talking to us in Greek or Latin and using a lang the language of the second or third century. So we're always using our own words, but we're trying to say the same content as what the apostles said. Uh, well, and more specifically, what is written in Scripture, right? Because uh, the church also decided, um, and this is also part of early church history, uh, that these particular books of the Bible were inspired in a way that they were very different from everything that came after them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think maybe, maybe Jim, I don't know if that, that might capture the almost like he's well, saying it, in his it, own words, what Paul is, uh, what Paul is meaning, you know, what Paul. I, I just kind of figured the only reason I asked is because I kind of figured that maybe he wasn't privy to that particular information. You know, maybe he didn't know about this. That's a, Really good question because who knows yeah. what he knew actually knew at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing that um, um I think this is another nuance of the author that that may be one of those things that I I may not hold to as much um, being a Catholic author that you know he sees something that theologically that I would not necessarily exactly hold to, so I would probably just strike the word. And, um, you know, there is an orderly succession, but we wouldn't be thinking it in terms of the way that they would be considering that. I think and that's a good point right there, coming we'll from his perspective. That, yeah, we'll be talking about that, the, the, the issue of succession a lot in the next class. That'll come out yeah. quite a bit in the, Catholic, in the Roman Catholic class, succession. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, so um, it's interesting. Here's this humble man, and, and he's trying to confront and um, hold people to the, the truth um, as they know it. Um, um, so he, he had the nerve to send this bold letter to the Corinthians. The Corinthians apparently not only heeded its direction, but they continued to read this letter as part of their Sunday worship for the next several hundred years. And better than that, they considered this letter so important that they copied and sent it all around the empire with other communities to read. Thus, the letter survived not only in the original Greek, but in Latin, Coptic, and Ethiopian. And the letter of Clements, which became the first papal encyclical, if you will, um, was regarded so high that it was even regarded as part of the New Testament in many parts of the empire, including Alexandria, one of the most important early Christian centers. So that is, that is a compelling testimony to the respect for the, the, the Church of Rome and its bishop, which extended in the early earliest days of, of the church. And so here he is, a bishop of Rome, which eventually becomes a, a little bit more of a a preeminent position than other bishops. Um, and just look at this this impact of that letter. Talking about that spiritual legacy, you know, you can think it goes to Christ, goes to Paul, goes to Clement. And for hundreds of years, the people want to be faithful to that. That's an ex a wonderful experience and and the Holy Spirit just being using this individual. So, and then we, like I said, we have this, we just have a snippet on um, from chapter one in first planet. Any other questions on that? Otherwise we'll finish up with first planet. So I think just again, to uh, relate this to scripture, when we see in, in like the book of Revelation, for example, because uh, Jim mentioned that, that Clement was killed for his faith, right? This, he was drowned to death. Mm -hmm. So we see in Revelation the martyrs, right, um, worshiping God and calling for justice. I think Revelation, um, I forget if it's five, Revelation five or six, where we see the martyrs before God in His presence. I mean, we know some of them. Here are some right here that were real. These were real, real people, right? Um, and Clement was one of them. 
And in some ways, we see Clement twice in Scripture. We see him referenced by Paul as his friend in Philippians. And then we also see him worshiping God in heaven, <laughs> you know, so uh, in Revelation, whether that's right now or in the future, we can leave from our time. But again, I think that's very important to consider, I think. So. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. Well, I think the other thing, too, is the fact that, uh, I mean, talking about his nature, you know, being very humble, you know, uh, sort of person, he yet he showed a boldness about himself, you know, to continue faithfully, you know, even to the point of death. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, a really good point, Gina. Um, that no matter what their personality was, there's things that we don't compromise on. And, he, and however God made each one of us, we're, we're still called to be faithful to things. And here's an example of a person that was a humble person. And we see all kinds of different personalities, rich and poor, famous, um, intelligent, um, various walks of life. And um, here we have Clement as our first witness that we get a chance to talk about. Um, so this is just a little bit of the political climate um, that, that Clement was under and what was happening with the, the, the rule of Rome, the rule of the Roman Empire. And so um, the, the son of Emperor Vespian, brother of Emperor Titus, there was Vespian and it went to Titus and it went to Domitian. Um, so Vespian was Nero's general during the first Jewish war when Nero um, murdered, he became, was murdered, he became emperor. Titus took over his father in the Jewish war, destroyed the temple, and became emperor when his father died. And then Domitian took over for his brother, probably the emperor associated with, with Revelation. He was, um, so that's maybe a little bit of context thinking from the, the political side. Um, and this is just a, a rough outline on some of the things that are covered in First Clement. He deals with Christology, which is the nature of who Christ is. That's what that is trying to, to mean. The truth found in Scripture. Um, he talks about ecclesiology as like, what is, a, what, is a, what is a church all about? He talks about that. Um, he prays for, for civil leaders in, in Romans 13 that talks about that we're supposed to be um, respectful of the, the civil magistrate, of, of, of those that are ruling us. Um, we have to be acting as part of society. We can't act all on our own. And we have to be faithful to truth. So there's a lot of interesting themes that we, we see in, in First Clement that, that pop up. So... Um, so how did this letter, um, what, what, it, what was its legacy? Um, Irenaeus thought Clement was a disciple of Paul and third bishop of Rome after Peter. Um, Clement was, um, Clement of Alexandria, which is someone we're going to talk about later. He thought that Clement's letter should be part of scripture. So there were some discussions, but like what Tony mentioned, um, in a sense, he kind of self uh, um, disqualifies himself, which kind of goes along with his personality. Um, Clement was was frequently used as a reference in canon law in the Middle Ages. Um, most modern um, pontiffs, popes, have referenced Clement in, in encyclicals or other writings. So it's very much enmeshed in um, Catholic um, doctrine and their their liturgy. And here it is: this one liturgy. It's in the Catholic. Liturgy of the Hours or Divine Office, it includes 12 readings from Clement. I, I'm not familiar with that liturgy, but maybe maybe you've heard of that, Tony. Well, I think the way those terms are used, so this would be something for um, the clergy. It's called, you know, in, in the Catholic world, you have the laity, which are the non-ordained members of the church. And then you have the clergy, that would be priests, priests and above, deacons, priests, bishops, all the way up to the pope. And um, there are certain spiritual practices uh, that clergy are, have throughout, you know, the history of the church have been 
uh, sort of encouraged to do, and that is prayers at specific hours of the day. Okay, so it's a sort of a spiritual discipline. So I'm, I'm thinking that's probably where some of these quotes yeah. from for, from First Clement or from the letter of Clement are part of their of these prayers uh, that the clergy uh, would do during the course of the day. Okay, maybe I'm not sure, but I think that's what it. Yeah, does. I didn't do the research for that, but um, I figured since you were teaching that class, you might have known the answer. So, um, and I think that's it for um, Clement. I think we'll, we'll we should be able to walk to this next one. Um, we'll get it started at least. And I, I really appreciate the dialogue. And so um, that's more important to me than trying to, to press through it. Um, so the, the Didache, the, it's, um, this is the, the teaching of the, of the Lord according to the apostles. Um, and so uh, that's like the, the longer title and it came to be known by the, the, the Greek word, the teachings, which is um, Didache. And so that's what it is. It's just a, a lot of different things that um, um, was just a, a list of all these practices and some of the key things that um, made sense and was in alignment with what the, the, the apostles were teaching. Um, so it had disappeared for quite some time, and then um, it was found. There was a copy that, that was uncovered. Um, it disappeared and remained hidden away for nearly a thousand years until we discovered in a monastic library in Istanbul. Mm. So what does it contain? It, it was written in Greek and dates back to the first century. Um, and it contains three sections. The first section is on Christian ethics. And it talks about the, the two days, good and evil. It describes virtuous ways of life and wicked way of death, so a comparison between them. And as a complete Lord's Prayer is included. So it's, if you've ever heard the term catechism, it's almost like a, a way of having uh, some uh, uh, nuggets of, of, of um, Christian teachings. It talks about spiritual rituals, um, baptism and communion. It talks about baptism by by immersion or by a fusion of inspiration, if not practical. So fasting is, is ordered on Wednesdays and Fridays, and um, it gives two prayers um, for communion. Um, and then it talks about church organization. Church organization was an early was in an early stage of development. Traveling apostles and prophets are important as chief priests in celebrating communion. And they would literally go around and, and give communion to, to various um, church communities. Local bishops and deacons have authority and were taking the place of traveling ministry. And so there was a slow emergence of having people that would be embedded there um, as the church started to, to develop. There, there was more of these church leaders that they could draw from. Who um who are the uh, the writers of the Didache? Does it does it say that? That's just something we don't know. It's one of these things that um, it, it never made it into scripture, but it was seen that this has some um, some very interesting um, spiritual um, um, insight that was worth having a study. So it's just one of those things that are interesting. It's not doesn't have the rank of scripture in terms of its authority. But um, if you start to look at it, what it contains um, and also reflect on the time of where it was, you know, like here it says that church organization was in an early stage of development. So it was sort of a developmental understanding of how these things should be worked out. The reason I ask is because, I mean, are, are, do people look at it because it's like you said, it's old, it's an old text? Do they give it some weight because of that? I mean, I, I just by reading what's in it, like the Christian ethics and the, and the spiritual rit rituals, it looks a lot like I'm guessing like, uh, and we'll probably learn about this in in the Catholic the Catholicism class. It looks a lot like it has a lot to do with the with the way that the Catholic Church is is, is organized. So I'm wondering if it's be is it is that all because of what's written in these books this, in the Didache? I would say that the you know. At least some of this is stuff that is um, you, you see one 
vector that's going in alignment with the the Roman Catholic Church, the the Catholic Church of you know before it was just the Roman Catholic Church. But there still are some things that we all would, would definitely agree to. You know, the Lord's Prayer. Of course, we're all going to follow that. Mm-hmm. You know, baptism, communion. Of course, we that would make sense. Having um, local ministers at a church. Every church needs to have a pastor. Um, so I would just, I think it's kind of an interesting document. It's also, for me, from maybe a, a, a historical point of view, if we get a reflection on how they thought that liturgy should be done at that time, you know, should you have instruments or not? Um, should there be harmonies or not? These are things that were debated for, for centuries. Um, so yes. those, those are some examples, things that start coming up. Nick, that's a really, that's a good answer, Jim. And Nick, that's a good question. And we will maybe ask that again in the Catholic class, but just so I don't forget that you did ask it. So I haven't read the DDK directly, but I, I know a bit about it. Um, and you got to remember, I said, Jim, do you know when it, when it was discovered, the actual extant manuscript? Because it seems that it was only referenced for many centuries. Um, but I'll say this. Um, yeah, I mean, you're in one sense, yes. And what we'll learn about in the Catholic class is Roman Catholic Roman Catholicism eventually went on to have a different view of authority than later Protestants thought was the original view of authority. Okay, so there was this development. And one of the things that is uh, critical to Roman Catholicism is that they have uh, so three sources of authority that are all sort of play off of each other. The, the primary one is even most, uh, you know, learned Roman class Catholics have to admit that scripture is still the primary source of authority. But another source of authority is tradition. OK, so that even non-canonical works <laughs> become, uh, significantly more important. So. Yes, in a sense, the DDK, uh, other early writings of church fathers, um, the, the Bible is supposed, I mean, the Roman Catholic Church has doctrines and even binding doctrines. Another word for binding doctrines is dogma that don't directly come from the Bible. They may come from these other sources of tradition. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah, that that, that is where things seem to start diverging, you know, fairly early. So you'll have some early writings where um, we could have, there might be 95% of overlap with what you and I would believe as Protestants or as evangelicals, but there might be a few things that were in there uh, that maybe didn't seem to align with, with what were in the canonical books, but that the Roman Catholic Church decided they also wanted to teach, but not only teach just for edification, but also as authoritative. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I just have a few other charts that talk about the, the content of the Didache and a little bit about the individual that actually rediscovered the Didache. Um, and these are also in the course packet as well. So in terms of the structure, there's 16 chapters the way that we have it um, structured now. And just as we saw before, um, it, it has a lot of these same things. Um, things about um, the church leadership, um, the Eucharist, communion. Um, and so that's just another way of, of looking at the order of it. Um, so the, the manuscript was discovered in a monastery in 1873. So relatively speaking, that's not that long ago. Um, this was an 11th century manuscript. It included the Clement's letter. That's another interesting note. But, um, but that such a document had existed was well known. Irenaeus, um, Augustine, and others in the fourth century referred to it as honored in the patristic period as an important teaching and referred to as the teaching of the Twelve. So people that you would hold in high regard thought this was an important document. So that's one of the reasons why it it started to continue to have um, um, viewed as something that is is noteworthy. Um, 
kind of went away. It was not seen in uh, the medieval Europe. Um, and it was only until 1873 that it was found. And this is the individual um, that, that found it. Um, oh, boy. I don't know if I need to try and pronounce his name. But that's Th his name. Philotheos Rienias. Rienias? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so... Anyway, he was studied and studied and studied, and um, they said, yep, it's a real deal. And so that's um, what they decided was, was the outcome. And the, uh, the DDK is the first Christian document we have that expressly um, mentions and outlaws abortion. Like, it uses that term and says that it is a sin, Just, just so we know. Yeah, that's a good point. So maybe that's another tidbit to, to go and read it. Um, it's the earliest book, book on Christian ethics, then it might be worth yeah. you know, taking that into consideration, what it says about abortion. Yeah. So um, just a little more historical context. So um, it kind of has a read like it's a handbook for a Christian community and how you should be doing Christian practice. And so a lot of the books were um, in, in the Bible, it's written as letters to churches, to individuals. And yet, how do you structure to pull that together? Like, how are we supposed to do our services? Um, what are some of the essence of what the, the church is supposed to be all about? This is like one of the early attempts to try, to write, try and write that up. Um, and so this is just a few snippets that I found, um, a couple of quotes. And so, um, be, not a, be not a stretcher out of thy hand to receive and a drawer of it back in giving. And so we're supposed to give as we should receive. Um, accept the things that happen to thee as good, knowing that without God, nothing happens. Um, Thou shalt hate all hypocrisy and everything that is not pleasing to God. Um, and then this other one here, that every true prophet who is willing to dwell among you is worthy of his meat. Likewise, a true teacher is himself worthy of, of his meat, even as a laborer. So we need to take care of those that are pastors and um, ministering to the, the word to us. Um, so the compiler of the Didache remained anonymous. But um, maybe has some similarities to Clement that way. Um, but just wanted to give a, a um, uh, an aggregation of things that should be church practice and how to how one should regard themselves. So we we talked about this, um, and, and thanks to the 11th century scribe named Leo and a monk from Istanbul, it has passed its on its way to us well. So the 11th century scribe. Um, made a copy, and then the monk from Istanbul found it. And so we have it for, for us. Um, I think I'm just going to skip that chart. Um, it, it starts to, to make a distinction between Christian and Jewish community of what exactly would a be in a church versus maybe a synagogue. So baptism with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, Jewish baptism is um, a baptism of cleansing, as a, if I recall right. And they actually had that um, practice. And of course, we have changed that. Um, they do not eat meat sacrificed to idols, otherwise no food prohibitions. And so um, they do not fast uh, uh, as the hypocrites. Um, they fast on different days. They, they fast on Wednesday and Fridays, not Monday and Thursdays. And, and we are not to pray as hypocrites. You're play, called to pray to our Heavenly Father. So then maybe there are some other examples of some distinctions. Any questions? I think that's a good breaking point. Um, I, I do appreciate um, you guys getting engaged and involved and um, 
please do ask plenty of questions or if you want clarification, um, let me know. OK. OK, thank um, you so much. Thank you for everybody. I'm going um, to go ahead and then I end the recording for now. We can just chat and form this will be more about New Hope Academy in general anyways. So.